first when uh, we were seriously talking about uh, joining the domestic council staff. We had a lot of friends in common because he had worked for Arthur D. Little. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fellow who uh, uh, actually in put us together was also another alumni of Arthur D. Little, uh, Andy Rouse. Who yeah. You may have run across his He's name. He's up on the uh, upcoming Northeastern swing. Good. Well, when you see him, say hello for me, because <laughs> I haven't talked to him for, I don't know, decades. But he was, I worked with him on a couple of projects at ADL, and then he had worked with Ed Harper, and he was also part of the Ash Council staff, and so he kind of took a yes. paternal interest in helping Ehrlichman and others staff the, the domestic council. So we're going to go through there and then, oh, sorry. Yeah, we're live. Oh, we well, okay. let me go ahead and, good. and introduce you. Um, okay. Good afternoon. Afternoon. It's July 27th, 2009. We're in Bellevue, Washington, and I have the honor and privilege to be interviewing Mr. Raymond Waldman for the Richard Nixon Presidential Library Oral History Project. Mr. Waldman, thank you for being with us. It's my pleasure. Let's go ahead and get started. We were talking okay. off camera a little bit. Um, you spent some time in the Panama Canal Zone. What was that like? <laughs> well, I've, I was a little kid, and it was great. I mean, it was a, a nice play to, uh, place to play baseball and climb trees and go swimming every day. And, you know, it, for me, it was just a, one long holiday. And uh, I didn't realize the significance of the canal. I mean, for a 10-year-old, you know, it's a canal. Uh, but I did see the sharp demarcation because one side of the fence was green and looked like America. The other side of the fence was a Latin American big city, Panama City, and had all the chaos and problems and noise and dirt of cities in that uh, condition in those days. So it was a real eye-opener for me to see that not everybody lived the way Americans live. You know? And it was, here was a very sharp uh, uh, contrast. This is a little bit different from upstate New York. Very, very much. What was that like compared to uh, Newfoundland? Well, Newfoundland uh, was a, 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 a weird experience for me because I was only there in the summers and then I would go up there for Christmas vacation because I was in school my father was stationed there in the uh, in the Air Force the US Air Force and um, it was uh, a, another strange culture for me I mean English speaking sort of I mean they have a very strange accent they were um, the Newf Newfoundlanders were very proud of the fact that for decades, maybe centuries, they had been an independent colony. They have, were not part of Canada. Straight through 49. They had only recently become amalgamated or whatever. So they, are, they were very proud of the fact that they were uh, an independent sort. They were not like Canadians, like those mainlanders. Um, they, they had a very rugged and hard life. I mean, it was it's cold. There's not much up there. You had paper mills and fishing, and that was, that's what they did. And then, of course, when the U.S. Air Force came into uh, the western part of the island, uh, uh, that brought a little bit more um, income and uh, support. But it was a that was another eye opener. I just want to ask. I don't want to get you yeah. in trouble, but uh, did you hear any uh, jokes about newfies when you were up there? Yes, I did. <laughs> Can I repeat them? No, I can't. <laughs> but uh, Newfoundlanders. Uh, they told a lot of stories about themselves, but of course, the rest of Canada has all sorts of newfie jokes. But uh, um, that's it's like Polish jokes, uh, you know, or Kentucky jokes. Or yeah, <clears throat> or in Brussels, uh, in Belgium, uh, the Walloons, the French speaking, talking about the Flemish speakers. I mean, you know, everybody who's looking over the fence sees some problems with the other guy, and they like to make fun of them. Why do you decide to go to MIT? Well, I thought I was going to be an engineer. Um, I was good in uh, math and science in high school, and I thought that's what 
people who were good in those subjects did. They became engineers. And um, I knew I wanted to go to an East um, Coast school, Ivy League if possible. And uh, when I was uh, in high school, I was the first year and a half in Denver and then the second year and a half in Greenville, Mississippi. And I think I may have been the only student from Mississippi to go to MIT that year, although there may have been one or two others. Uh, and I thought that this was where I was headed. And after about uh, two or three years of uh, MIT, I decided, no, this is not, this is not what I'm cut out to do. I ran into uh, a lot of people who were smarter than I was and uh, who were better prepared. And it was, uh, that was another eye-opener, uh, that I wasn't really as smart as I thought I was. So you ended up doing two degrees? I got two degrees because I felt after I'd gotten the first degree in engineering that I had many gaps in my education, and the in economics and philosophy and history and languages and literature, all of those things that if you're on a straight course in MIT, you don't take a lot of those things. But I stayed another year and filled as many gaps as I could. Did you ever work at the Lincoln Labs? Or? No, I worked at the instrumentation lab, uh, which was doing the uh, uh, instrumentation for the Apollo landing missions. And that was uh, kind of exciting. That was just part-time work for me after I graduated. Um, and while I was in law school, so um, uh, two or three afternoons a week, I'd hop on my little motorcycle and run from Harvard Law down to the instrumentation lab and shift gears and work on, on uh, technological uh, subjects. This is the NAV and the guidance system? Yes. For mm -hmm. Yes, you've got it. What does this entail? Well, in those days, uh, you know, most computers were the size of this room. And, uh, or a bigger room. Or a bigger room. And um, the, um, one of the innovations in the instrumentation lab was to begin to shrink computers down to sizes that would fit inside a capsule. And then there was a little problem of you know, guiding um, a, a spacecraft uh, some millions of miles and, and try to hit a particular point. And so the instrumentation lab had come up with um, gyro systems, which um, then were quite um, unique and advanced. Of course, today, every airliner has them, and, and all missile systems uh, use these guidance systems. But then it was, uh, it was quite... Uh, quite advanced to be able to put something together that would sense motion or attitude and um, then correct the spacecraft. So, the, you know, you're constantly measuring and then uh, making fine-tuning adjustments to keep it on, on path. And the computer told you what adjustments to make, and the gyro did the measuring. So that's the sort of the basics. Uh, theory of the thing. But it was uh, great to be a part of something that big. Uh, you know, and we were just, a, well, my group was a very small group. I mean, we were just doing technical reports and editing and looking for patentable ideas and keeping track of documentation. I mean, a sort of the, the administrative side of, of this. My group was not uh, a scientific or uh, technical group. It was a technical support team. Oh, this is interesting. You mentioned patents. This is almost 20 years before Bobby Dole. I didn't know that uh, MIT was that entrepreneurial. Yes. Well, um, they realize they should be entrepreneurial. They have all of these interesting people doing interesting things, and some of them could mean significant patents for MIT and therefore significant income. Now at the same time you're doing this work in the afternoons, you're taking <laughs> college
contracts and torts and civ pro. Yes, all of that other good stuff in the mornings and uh, early afternoon. And uh, I think I was, at that point, maybe one of the first, if not the first, person to actually drive a motorcycle at Harvard Law School. This was, these were the days when motorcycles were considered kind of a low-class, ultra device. And you know, you didn't, everybody else was in coats and ties. And, and here I'm roaring around campus on a motorcycle. And it just, it wasn't the Harvard Law image that uh, most ha people have. What kind was it? It was a BMW. <laughs> didn't see Honda, didn't see Harley. So. Yeah, no, I had a Honda first, but then uh, that was underpowered, so I had to get the BMW. <laughs> I assume you maintained it yourself? Um, yes and no. I didn't have it very long. It was only a couple of years, so fortunately I didn't have to do very much. Well, this is, this is a, a great time at Harvard Law. I guess it's always a great time at Harvard Law. Um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about it. Was it like the paper chase? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, large classrooms, um, some dominating and domineering professors, um, very competitive. Again, a lot of really smart people who had gone through all sorts of different experiences. Most people in Harvard Law School had not, were not, um, starting law school immediately after their bachelor's degree. Many of them had worked, traveled, uh, had scholarships, uh, gone to um, Oxford for, a, you know, a Fulbright, you know, the, all kinds of things. Some of them had played professional sports. I mean, we had everything. Um, so it was, uh, it was a very interesting uh, group. Again, I was not... Uh, I, I didn't grow up thinking I would always be a lawyer. This was sort of a late career decision. Um, but many of the people in the class had thought that this is what they were going to do, and so they had taken pre-law courses or studied history and constitution. So they were much better prepared again. But uh, they also felt that the, the right career path was to get a Clerk, clerkship with a judge, Supreme Court if possible, but you know, any any clerkship was better than none. Uh, go to a big firm, work there for six or seven years as an associate, become a partner, start uh, earning big bucks, become uh, an officer of um, uh, the bar association, uh, uh, sit on corporate boards, uh, and retire to Florida. I mean, sort of that career path. And I thought this was too cut and dried for me. I mean, I, I didn't think that that's what I was cut out to do. And so I, my life took a different path. Did you uh, know Dean Griswold at that point? I met him. Uh, he was the dean. Uh, actually, I met his son and worked with his son at Arthur D. Little when uh, he and I were both consultants there. Um, and through his son, I got to see him, but not as a student. As a student, he was, you know, he was distant. But as a father, he was fine. <laughs> I would imagine you saw him about as much as you would have seen Roscoe Pound or? Yes, yeah. I think so. Uh, did you uh, apply for uh, the, an assistantship position with one of the firms afterward? Or how did you end up at Arthur D. Little? Well, um, the summer before graduation, um, the, uh, I was working again back at the uh, instrumentation lab, uh, but now I was doing it full time. And so I, um, I was uh, not really looking around for a, an internship or an associate position or a summer job for that. But I did run into some people at um, Arthur D. Little that summer uh, who were looking for some part-time help, and I got involved with that. So when it came time for interviewing in my senior year, or my third year of law school, um, 
it actually was easier for me to think of continuing with Arthur D. Little than getting a new job with a new firm. I did talk to a few firms. I talked to one in Denver, went out to Denver, and, and um, thought that, you know, that would be a possible fit. My wife was not um, that interested in moving to Denver, but maybe she could have been convinced. Um, I did talk to one or two Boston firms, <clears throat> uh, but they all said, oh, you're an engineer and you're a lawyer. Obviously, you're going to do patent law, aren't you? And I said, no, I don't want to do patent law. Let's look at some alternatives. Uh, and they said, well, that's really what we do with lawyers who are also engineers. So uh, Arthur D. Little came along, and I thought, well, that, you know, this is uh, this different kind of experience. Why not? I just have to ask for posterity's sake. You didn't apply with uh, Nixon much, did you? No, no, did not. While you're at Arthur D. Little, you do a lot of work that these days would be really straightforward policy evaluation work. Um, tell us a little bit about that. I did a lot of different studies at ADL which were related to government policy. And I think it was because of the law background, people in the firm felt that I had some understanding of how government worked or what we could do with government. And uh, some of these were um, industrial development projects that were sponsored by governments, um, developed plans for uh, uh, the industrialization of some of the cities in uh, Ireland and in Greece and in Belgium. Um, when I was uh, working from the United States, I also spent a couple of months in Saudi Arabia, their early development uh, program. Um, I did a lot of uh, government evaluation work, um, post office, how Congress works, uh, highway planning, um, rail railroad uh, planning, all kinds of things. I want to ask you about this uh, a little bit because of my own background. And I'm starting my second year as a political science PhD at Georgetown uh, because the word econometrics jumped off the page <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, brought back only mild nightmares. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How were you using social scientific tools at this point? I'm asking because of what you do later on. Right. Uh, the, the major uh, kind of metric tool we were using then were input-output studies, uh, which had been developed by some economists, and, and the process had been refined by people at uh, Arthur. At the time? Yes, exactly. Uh, but at Arthur D. Little, with the industrial or uh, planning applications. And I was just fascinated that you could catch Know, capture the economic activity, soup to nuts, of some geographically defined area. It could be a city, a county, a state, country, whatever. And uh, you could measure what was going on and portray it through simple matrix of numbers. And I guess it's the engineer training coming out saying, you know, this is a good thing to be able to do. Um, but then you have to draw some conclusions. I mean, it's one thing to have the table, but then you have to be able to say, okay, uh, we're going to change this, or we're going to modify things to change the incentives, or we're going to uh, use this as an analytical tool to say some things we're doing well and other things we're not doing so well, so let's concentrate on the things we're doing well. So that was basically how we did it. And these are pretty complicated models. I mean, this is not uh, this is not ISLM. This is fourteen hundred equations. Exactly, and remember, we're still working in the era of computers the size of this room, and and no desktops, and everybody had little calculators and slide rules. I mean, you remember a slide rule. Um, there are all sorts of things that we do, you know, sort of as a uh, second nature today. I mean, a spreadsheet Excel would, you know, set this up in no time at all. But in those days, it's hard to think of those days, but that's 40, 50 years ago, uh, you had to do all of this calculation more or less by hand. Ed Harper has a story about 
you know, and be going to a young woman and saying, you know, we have to reset this table, you know, it's a 25 by 25 matrix, mm -hmm. um, and she breaks down. <laughs> yes. Today it would be a push a few buttons and it's done. So you're getting to know a variety yes. of, of approaches, you're getting to know a variety of things. Why do you leave the private sector? Well, um, I don't remember exactly how many projects I worked on at Arthur D. Little. It must have been, you know, 50, 75 in the six years I was there. And I looked at it as a, as a sort of a post-graduate education in business and economics and planning and government, practical government uh, operations. And um, I've always been interested in the next challenge, the next activity. Uh, and money was never the main goal. My friends can't understand this, but uh, I've always thought that the more interesting thing to do was to, to take on a new challenge and to work with new people in a new situation and to do well in that situation and be recognized and then move on. Uh, not do the same thing and not do it just to earn money. Um, so as a result, I'm poor today, but I had a, a very interesting life. So when, when um, Ed Harper and uh, uh, Andy Rouse um, connived to uh, get me to uh, think about joining the White House in 69, 70, I said, gee, this is a great idea. I didn't know what I was going to do. I mean, uh, I had never paid attention to the political side of government. Um, I was living in Europe at the time. Uh, I'd been in Europe for three years. And so uh, a lot of the, the uh, oh, uh, attitudes and uh, uh, polarization of the U.S. society, both from Vietnam War, but also because of the Nixon administration, had escaped me. I mean, so I thought, well, this is a good idea. I start something new and different. What were your politics like before you got the invitation? <laughs> had you been a Goldwaterite? No, I had actually been a um, Massachusetts Democrat. Um, sort of the Moynihan wing of the Democratic Party. But um, in Massachusetts, where I'd lived for 15 years, um, the Democratic primaries were where the elections were decided. And I thought, well, that's OK. I, I really wasn't political. I didn't care which party I was part of or registered for. And when I happened casually to mention this to Ed Harper and uh, um, I guess it was, uh, it wasn't Ehrlichman, but uh, um, um, Was it Malik? No, it wasn't Malik. Um, well, it would come to me. Anyway, they basically said, uh, what are your, what are views, your views about federal state relations and how do you see government running and, uh, and, and uh, we were on the same page on those issues but my affiliation didn't seem to matter. Well you come in in November 70. Yes, and just after the elections. Just after the elections. Mm -hmm. You hit the ground running with new federalism. That was a surprise to me. I thought I'd go through some kind of uh, internship learning period. Uh, you know, uh, they'd send me to get the coffee cups or something for a while. But it didn't happen that way. The next thing I knew, there was a little thing called uh, the uh, general and special revenue sharing proposals. And these were to be submitted to Congress in the State of the Union message and to be immediately followed up with special messages and legislation. And I didn't know what these ideas were, but I thought, okay, that's something we can learn together. And, and that's what I worked on. I mean, it was the first thing out of the box. 
I want to turn to your specific issues because your portfolio at the White House, you fit a lot into a couple of years at the White House. Mm -hmm. Move a little bit to talk about your stint in state and in your time yes. with uh, President Ford. Uh, but I want to ask you because you did write, and I'll just uh, state it here for the record in a uh, public administration review, mm -hmm. this very interesting defense of the domestic council and situating it, uh, justifying it in organizational terms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd actually like to ask you some questions about of course. about the domestic council overall. Yeah. Um, so in true Brian Lamb fashion, <laughs> what was the domestic council? What did it do? Well, uh, the way I understood it was that um, the Ash uh, Commission had looked at the uh, the way the National Security Council functioned and basically said, well, we need something like that for the domestic side of the government because there was a structure, there was a, a, a hierarchy of staff support, but on the domestic side, um, Every president seemed to invent his own way of doing things. And it was always a little bit um, catch as catch can. I mean, Ted Sorensen did it for Kennedy and, you know. Uh, Joe Califano. Califano, yeah. So, I mean, you had every president kind of turn to his trusted uh, friends and who knew what they were doing. And, and it, it seemed logical to me that when you look at the government, you say, okay, we've got national security and defense items or issues over here. We've got domestic policy issues. And then we either have economic policy issues as part of domestic or it's a separate thing. And that kind of went back and forth uh, over the years. But the domestic policy issues, uh, they're of all types. I mean, it's very hard to categorize. It's just about everything that's not in the, secu the uh, national security bucket goes into domestic policy. And so you needed a staff of people who could deal with a wide range of things and have enough knowledge to be able to ask good questions and understand when people were giving you straight answers or when they were trying to put something over or that you could deal uh, with uh, cabinet level officers and uh, high political appointees and of course the senior bureaucrats and the Hill and the press all with a certain amount of, uh, of background and knowledge. And I think that's what the domestic council was as an institution when it was created. Ehrlichman and others said, it was, uh, it was Marty Anderson, that, that was the fellow I was trying to think of, uh, because he kind of vetted me when I was being hired, and, and he was the one who asked some of these questions about, you know, what are, you, what are your views? And the, the idea was to have uh, a, a, a smallish staff, I mean, it, I guess it grew to about 35 people or so, you can probably tell me how many at the maximum, um, who uh, had uh, a White House overview with the President's agenda in mind of all of the government activity. Uh, and that was, that's what we did. You ask a question in the article, and it's appropriate here. Why Nixon in 1970? Why not Johnson in 66? Or well, first of all, I think Nixon was a more organized person. I think he, you know, he could see the 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 way that uh, government worked um, first from his vantage point as vice president to a military commander, Ike, and then second, you know, maybe he saw some of the problems of the government during the era when it, these uh, policy issues were not dealt with in a systematic way. And he might have said, you know, I see what the National Security Council arrangements are doing under Kissinger, and we don't have anything like that over here. He tried first with Moynihan and then uh, with uh, uh, 
uh, somebody else before. Arthur Yeah, uh, before Ehrlichman. And, and Ehrlichman then kind of built this organization with the support and assistance of the Ash, uh, Ash Council. One of the things that's striking is how many of these people who were involved in the Domestic Council were not politicians, were not bureaucrats, were not Washington <laughs> people at all. I'm a typical case. I mean, you know, maybe some of the people who were on the Domestic Council staff had come up through the political ranks. But Ed Harper and I and the, the people that he hired uh, were not political. In fact, he very explicitly said, I don't want you to worry about the politics of uh, policy recommendations. We've got a lot of other people who can do that. You just tell us what you think is the right solution. I thought, well, I can do that. <laughs> you mentioned that there's a front office, Ehrlich mm -hmm. Cole, uh, project managers, John Whitaker, Ed, right. and then you also have a kind of professional, I assume that the, the professional staff, the policy and planning people, were mostly civil servants, and the front office project managers guy were more likely to be political? There were very few um, 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 bureaucrats in the traditional sense of the word. Uh, all of us hired were from outside the government. Now, we were all political appointees. Um, there were some political, there were some bureaucratic or governmental support staff, but uh, that's it. So, uh, you know, most of us had a resume like mine. We came from someplace else, doing something else, practicing law, management consulting, academia, and we were not political. We had, some of them had worked in campaigns, but they were not, they were not politicians themselves. Um, they were not retread congressmen, well, except for Moynihan, but that's a special case. Um, most of the, us uh, came from other walks of life. We were not from the government. How did it work when you became, you know, when you're acting as pro you know, project managers and you're facing down <laughs> George Romney said. Well, it was very interesting that uh, we seemed to be able to get away with it uh, because uh, either we had the uh, authority of the president coming down through Ehrlichman or we had the, uh, uh, the ability to uh, say that's not the president's agenda. That's not what he would like to have done. And so we could, we could always um, deal with the agencies, the assistant secretaries, the undersecretaries, and occasionally cabinet secretaries, with uh, that kind of response. Um, or we'd start the process by saying, here's what the president wants to have done and now it's up to you to figure out how to do it or you know, how to deal with this. Um, and we had a lot of people who knew or how to get the president's approval or decision, um, and therefore we had the authority of um, a presidential initial in the, in the right box um, to, to do something or not to do something. Well, let's take a concrete example of that, and then we'll get back to some organizational matters. Uh, you prepare a memo mm -hmm. with John Ehrlichman uh, regarding the statement of principles. You know, where does the Nixon administration stand, federal vis-a-vis -vis state authority, project evaluation, program management? Mm -hmm. And this goes to the president in December of 70, which is quite soon. but. You circulated first for comment. Yes, uh, but uh, not you know, not widely. I mean, these were not necessarily um, consensus documents that were being put together. I always viewed my job as taking the documents, the reports, the position papers, 
the speeches, whatever, all of the raw material and synthesizing it into some document, usually no longer than two or three pages. I mean, this was a sort of a outside rule. Nobody wanted to read long things and you know you, you knew that it would never get read if you had a long document. You could have a lot of attachments but the whole the cover had to be short. Um, and to um, give it to um, those people on the domestic council or at OMB who were involved in that issue but who were looking at it from the White House presidential perspective, not from the agencies, not from the political side of the house, not from the speech writers, not from the advance men, definitely not from people outside the, the, the uh, you know, the, the presidential family. And then to say, okay, um, if there were dissenting views, you noted those and say, so-and-so agrees and so-and-so doesn't agree. And that's why we have a need for a presidential decision. Well, it's interesting. I was going to ask you specifically how, not just on paper, mm -hmm. but day to day, the domestic council staff interacted with the other boxes, OMB, for instance. Yeah. Well, OMB was critical to the process. And I had a lot of interaction with them. And um, that was part of what I did later on was work with OMB. Um, but there were very few other organizations that you had to interact with. Uh, occasionally, the Council of Economic Advisors, CEA, when you talk about policy. Occasionally, with the Office of Science and Technology, when you had a technological or scientific issue. Occasionally, with NSC, if there was some question about uh, how a domestic policy might affect another country or another initiative where or the boundaries were not that clear between the jurisdictions but um, that's about it I had very little contact with outside uh, outside groups um, lobbyists um, associations uh, corporations you know, they were just not they were they were screened out by and large, by others, either in the departments or other parts of the White House. And so there's nothing going on horizontally with, say, um, public liaison, the Colson job? Very few, very very few opportunities or occasions. I didn't have much to do with uh, Congress or congressional staff. That was all handled through congressional liaison. Public liaison and the, uh, the media offices, you know, worked with them. And they would they would occasionally, uh, if you were talking about a, a public presidential document, either a speech or a message to Congress, those got vetted all across. But when you're talking about a decision paper or a synthesis, that did not normally get vetted across all of these organizations. Well, let's um, pursue this a little bit because as I understand it, domestic council did policy planning, mm -hmm. sometimes a little bit of policy implementation in terms of coming up with legislative drafts, helping the bureaucracies to actually understand what it was they were supposed to do, mm -hmm. and then also monitoring. And is that is that a fair assessment? Yes, it is. And some of our domestic policy um, activities were more geared towards um, monitoring or developing legislation, particularly in the environmental area, for example. Um, the areas where I worked, though, we were basically talking about policy ideas, which would then be implemented by somebody else or some other organization or by uh, a department or some other, some other part of the, the White House. So I, I didn't really get that deeply involved in implementation or legislation. How would this work? And let's just talk about the, uh, oh, sorry. Um, okay. Um, but first, let's go ahead and uh, just pick up. Mm -hmm. So policy genesis, new federalism, 
mm -hmm. replacing categorical grants mm -hmm. with block grants. Mm -hmm. This seems to be fully in tune uh, with the administration's philosophy. Right. I've interviewed Jim Falk. He's right. explained right. how this works. What actually goes into it? It's one thing for the president to deliver a message. Right. But what goes on before it gets to his desk? Well, um, I can't tell you where the idea came from to go to the block grants, uh, but the ideas were already there by the time I joined the staff. And so the question was, how do we move this forward? And the idea was to make this a center point, a centerpiece of the State of the Union message, and then to follow it up with a series of very specific proposals. The uh, the proposals were negotiated between the domestic council staff and the departments that were involved. Uh, but Krogh, for example, handled all of the justice grants that were being consolidated in a law enforcement uh, uh, block grant. Uh, there was transportation uh, with uh, Volpe and uh, housing with Romney. And Those, I think there were six or eight of these uh, block grants. Um, my job at that point was merely to provide some of the sound and music to go along with the, the proposals, uh, to make the proposals, to, to describe the rationale for the proposals and the, uh, the background, why the categorical grants were a, bad way to go. They minimized uh, um, um, local decision making and maximized federal um, um, influence on how money was spent and we wanted to move away from that and give the states and localities more of a say on how they spent the money. And. Um, get the government out of the micromanagement business. So somebody had to say all that, and somebody had to say it in a way that made sense, and so that's why the State of the Union message and the, the, the specific messages were drafted. But the actual content of the grants themselves, the block grants, were, were negotiated between the White House staff, largely domestic council and largely uh, Ken Cole and uh, Ehrlichman and the, the domestic council fellows who had the responsibility for that area, along with the departments involved and with the, a lot of uh, input from governor's associations and mayor's associations and county execs and all those other people who would be affected by these things. Um, so that was a process that was going on uh, I wasn't uh, directly part of it. I could see it happening, but I, I was glad that it was going on and that we came up with solutions, that we came up with packages that made some sense. It strikes me that one of the big themes with um, new federalism was working with elected mm -hmm. officials and not going through you know, authorities or you know, non-elected in the states or in yep. the localities. Mm -hmm. Was that a conscious focus? Or? Yes, it was. But it was also elected officials at lower levels, or you know, at uh, levels that were closer to the people. That was the, the theme. You know, get out away from uh, sending everything to Washington. And um, you know, some of uh, um, um, some of the speeches around that time were pretty uh, uh, pretty dramatic. Um, Pat Buchanan was writing some interesting stuff for the vice president and you know don't, it, it tended to um, you know get uh, uh, get the energies uh, flowing of those people who wanted to uh, make some changes or had to make changes. Um, but I wouldn't say that we uh, uh, consciously we're trying to get um, all of the um, non-electeds out of the process. 
I mean, we talked about the Iron Triangle of, you know, the federal bureaucrats and the congressional staff and the associations and that they controlled this process. We had to get those people, you know, to minimize their impact on, on, the, on the decision making or spending money. And that meant getting other people involved, like local officials. What kind of uh, arguments did you run up against at that point? Well, I didn't run up against any. I was working for the president, and I was, you know, doing what he wanted to do. And everybody I contacted or talked to was also a presidential staffer or appointee. So I wasn't on the front line having to deal with the the pushback from Congress or from the associations. There were other people who were doing that, and they might have not liked it, but um, I didn't. I didn't feel it. One thing you uh, point out in your article is that um, the domestic council staffers got mess privileges and <laughs> office space in the uh, OEOB. And right. Why is that significant? Oh, I mean, these the sorts of uh, indicators of uh, proximity to the man are very important in government. And if if we had been stashed in some, uh, you know, Quonset hut across uh, the Anacostia River, uh, well, nobody would have paid any attention to us. But if, you know, as long as we had offices on the first floor of the old executive and we all had White House uh, badges, and we, uh, Ehrlichman and, and Cole were, you know, officed in the White House on the second floor of the West Wing, and uh, we all, you know, enjoyed mess privileges, and we could invite people to the mess to see how important we were. Uh, that sort of thing, you know, it makes a big difference in how other people perceive you and how they treat you and how uh, they um, uh, how how far they think they can go in opposing you. This is a almost trivial detail. I don't think we've ever asked anyone before, though. How is the food in the White House mess? Well, it's very good. A um, little a little, um, a little um, pedestrian. I mean, there are no. Uh, no surprises. Uh, um, hamburgers were pretty much the, you know, the, the food of the day, although there were always uh, specials and there were always other things you could get. Um, but there were also two more White House messes. There is the one for the really big guys, uh, and that's where Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Moynihan, Kissinger, when he wasn't eating at his desk, uh, ate. And then next to it was the staffer White House mess. So really two, two different things. But they're right next to each other, same kitchen. And occasionally, um, you would have a luncheon meeting with a, a distinguished outside visitor, governor, or somebody, somebody from a foreign country. And you'd eat in the, um, the uh, higher level White House mess. But if you just had an ordinary visitor, and I mean ordinary like a friend or a colleague from one of the departments or somebody that you wanted to uh, talk over, talk business over, you'd, you'd eat in the staff mess. I don't know. I just think that we'd, uh, <laughs> all the people we've ever uh, asked you know, these sorts of questions, so I don't think we've ever gotten, <laughs> you provided us the definitive answer on this. <laughs> uh, Let's talk about some of the other things that you have. Mm -hmm. Phase two comes. Um, this is, I guess, about a year later. Mm -hmm. You're working on health services. Right. What's that like? What are your responsibilities? Well, that was in the context of uh, the um, campaign to uh, control inflation. And uh, Rumsfeld had been uh, designated as the inflation czar, and um, um, they had 
identified rising health costs, what a surprise, as one of the major sources of inflation. And in those days, uh, it's hard to think of this about 35 years ago, um, health costs were a significant part of the economy, but uh, not as significant. I think maybe they were 6 or 8% of the economy. But rising faster in cost than any other segment. And so um, in good logical fashion, uh, they decided to set up a cost control council just looking at health costs and set up a commission of, uh, of independent people from the, that sector, uh, doctors, hospital administrators, nurses, uh, oh, I don't know, uh, people from insurance companies, uh, medic pharmaceutical companies, uh, health uh, equipment. And uh, the idea was to get some, and a few people who were on the receiving end, corporations and uh, unions, uh, and see if, if we could come up with ways to control health, the, the, the rise in health costs. And it was, a, it was a valiant effort, but fruitless. Um, uh, we had a couple of meetings, very, very nice uh, photo opportunities with the president, where all of the members of the commission were, were there, and the president was uh, you know, shaking their hands. And, but uh, there really wasn't any agreement on how to do it, or what to do, or whether it was even necessary or worthwhile. Uh, and it's the same debate we're having today, exactly the same debate. Um, you know, do you try to impose government controls on health costs? Uh, do you set up competing schemes? Do you um, set standards for hospitals and pharmaceuticals beyond Medicare and Medicaid and, and the s systems that we already have in place? Uh, or is the rise in health care just a function of the fact that we're all getting better health care? I mean, it costs more to have all the tests and all the exams and all the pharmaceuticals that we have today. And new stuff is coming off the assembly line every day, and it's going to cost more. To say nothing of the, uh, the argument that any pharmaceutical uh, has a very high development cost. A lot of companies like to get that back while the drug is under patent because once the patent expires and it goes into uh, um, uh, you know, free market, uh, it's a different, uh, different cost structure. Um, so, you know, maybe it's just a function of uh, getting better health. Is this about the time that the idea of the HMO comes around? Um, yeah, I think HMOs were part of that, but uh, frankly, I'm not uh, not really a little foggy on that particular detail. Was your job more than to convene these talks, or was it to actually come up with a solution? Both. Um, we had a very small staff. Um, the woman who was working with me on that later became the Social Security Administrator, uh, Dorcas Hardy. Um, and we had a couple of other people. And we were the central staff for this effort. Um, the commission of these um, people from the various sectors of, the, of health care uh, didn't meet that often. It wasn't a full-time job for them. So somebody had to prepare data analysis, position papers, uh, all of that sort of stuff for them to react to. Uh, so that's what that's what we did as a staff. I want to ask about one of the other things that fell on your plate. The Office of Science and Technology. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell us about it. Well, um, it's uh, um, I've only I've only seen a part of it, so I'm sure I'm not uh, telling the whole story. But 
it's quite clear that in the early Nixon administration, and maybe even during the first year that I was there in 1970, uh, the president and Ehrlichman and uh, the top folks at OMB all felt that the Office of Science and Technology was not on board, that it was had its own agenda, that it was basically playing to the academics and to the uh, official scientific community. And this was troubling because, you know, you don't want to have on your team, the White House team, uh, people who represent a different agenda. And it was the feeling that that's what was happening with science and technology. So uh, the effort was first to uh, vet their, their products make sure that they were consistent with the government's, uh, I mean, with the president's agenda, and second, to minimize their influence. Uh, and I think both of these were, um, to some degree, successful. But um, as we've seen recently with uh, stem cells and other uh, government policy, global warming, these things have a way of coming back and the, you know, the balance gets redressed, the pendulum swings in the other direction, and so now uh, we have a president who's um, uh, touting his ability and willingness to listen to the uh, scientific community, as if one needed to say that. I mean, obviously, science and technology are delivering new products and policies and and, and uh, ways of doing things, whether we like it or not. Um, so, but there was a was well, a definite feeling that the um, science and technology and science advisor in the office at that time, 1970, 71, 72, were not on board, and that they needed to be um, contained. Well, I ask this um, not for this project, um, but other places, and uh, as we were doing our research, we found these. Um, Edward David and Dick Garwin mm -hmm. have both said very harsh things about their time in the administration. Um, I think they, a lot of it focuses over questions like the evaluation of ABM. Mm -hmm. um, you can see a little bit why they, why don't they weren't on right. the reservation. Yep. Was there a feeling that OST was simply, from the administration's point of view, badly staffed? Was there a feeling that organizationally this was just a duplication of work going on elsewhere? I mean, what, was, what, what was behind the decision to transfer a lot of these responsibilities to NSO? Um, well, you know, the office had a tradition, a history, of being very central in the Kennedy administration, and maybe Johnson, it was a very important part of the, uh, in fact, the uh, president of MIT uh, went down um, as, as the science advisor, and you know, people during the war, during the the, uh, the development of the atom bomb, you know, the science advisor was a crucial part of the administration decision making. Uh, by the time I was there, uh, this was no longer the case. Now, it may have been that on certain issues like ABM, where there was an, an administration initiative and where some of the, um, I don't know, negative uh, analysis was coming out of o OST, that people just said, look, we can't have that, you know. Um, we've, we've, gotta, we've gotta all be singing from the same song sheet here. If you wanna do it as a private citizen, be my guest. But if you're in the government role, uh, you can either tell me privately, and you know, uh, listen, and that's part of what the uh, policy making apparatus was all about, was to make sure that the voices were heard within the, within the family. But don't go outside the family and make public uh, your uh, disagreements or your opposition with government policy, or more specifically, with the president's policies. 
Um, I know that uh, some of the NSF uh, issues, uh, transfer was to make sure that there was less political influence one way or the other and the NSF could do a better job of, of uh, assessing who gets uh, grant money and who doesn't, or what projects uh, get uh, funded um, without, you know, uh, a, uh, uh, internal reward system for the scientific community. Now, I know, you know, had David left in a, you know, very bad taste in his mouth about all of this. One other thing I wanted to ask, which is a neighboring issue, I suppose, and because of where we are and because of your later career, uh, the SST. Mm -hmm. Were you involved with that at all? Not the decision to cancel the program, but the fallout. Uh, once the program was canceled, Boeing and a few other companies who were involved in it found themselves with a lot of engineers and a lot of facilities dedicated to that program and to one or two others, by the way. There was the, the uh, nuclear-powered aircraft that the Defense Department was working on, and some other things. And in 1971, I guess, maybe 72, um, there was an effort to find things for these engineers to do um, or to support other programs that these companies could um, bid on. And I did a little bit of work around that issue, and uh, that's one of the first times I met some people from Boeing, and I guess that's one of the reasons I came out to Seattle and joined Boeing, it's because I liked uh, what I saw. How did that end up? I know that Boeing had massive layoffs in the early 70s. They did. That was the time when the, when the billboard went up, you know, last person leaving Seattle, uh, turn out the lights. Uh, the, uh, as I remember, the something like uh, Boeing's employment went from, oh, I don't know, I was going to say about 150,000 down to about 30,000. And I've heard some of the horror stories from the Boeing side once I joined the company about how they had to decide, you know, here's 10 people and I can only keep one or two, you know, what are we going to do with the other eight? Um, it was... Um, and unfortunately, you know, you, you don't want to turn all these highly trained engineers and technicians into uh, gas station attendants and, um, you know, uh, taxi drivers. So there was, a, there was an effort to try to find new public projects that they might be able to work on that would use some of their capabilities and skills. And so we asked the departments to come up with ideas of things that they could do. And uh, I don't think it was terribly successful. I mean, uh, these people were aeronautical engineers. They used to working on, uh, on the, you know, high stress um, um, airplane design. And, uh, you know, plumbing fixtures were not going to do it for them. I just thought I would ask because, yeah. of course, not only your portfolio at the time, but mm -hmm. but later. Um, there's a lot of push for federal government, internal reorganization during the Nixon years. And the yes. OST reorg is mm -hmm. part of that. Right. President Nixon says that he wants to slim down EOP. And he wants to create, of course, the, uh, the four counselors, the right. president. Mm -hmm. What was your role in that? Well, that was close to the time when I was moving out of the government and out of domestic council over to the State Department. Um, the idea was to have, as you say, four super cabinet secretaries who, who were bridging the gap between the departments and the president, or the office of the president, but also had a management responsibility for the departments. Ehrlichman and the Domestic Council never had the management responsibility for the departments. Uh, OMB um, didn't have responsibility. It was lodged in the cabinet secretaries. It's where, you know, it's always been. It's where it is today. 
but the idea was to uh, make sure that the cabinet secretaries and the upper levels of the departments were also president's people to a greater degree than they had been in the past. Just being appointed by a president is one thing, but once you're there in the department, you're seeing, you're, you know, you're seeing your bureaucratic staff every day. You're reading the papers from the, uh, your, your department. You're seeing the, uh, the uh, constituents of your department every day. And you're only seeing the White House folks, you know, once a week or once a month. And usually it's in a, either a ceremonial occasion or a scripted occasion. And so you really are not having uh, constructive interaction with the president's people or president's agenda. So the idea was to sort of bridge that, change that uh, dynamic a little bit. Um, and that was happening as I was leaving the department. Of course, I was interested because I knew all the people involved and I could see some of the things that uh, might, uh, might be improved if we did it and it worked. Um, but uh, I guess uh, one of the things that I appreciated from uh, Ehrlichman and Harper was that they made it very easy for those of us who were uh, not involved in Watergate and who wanted to stay in the government to do so. And so that's when I moved to the State Department. I want to pick up with that in just yep. a minute. I have uh, two last questions on the nope. domestic council. No problem. I've got um, all afternoon. <laughs> well, the, the, the first is actually something that I am idiosyncratically interested in. Um, and unfortunately, Winston Blount is no longer with us. Mm -hmm. um, but because you worked on this issue a bit at Arthur D. Little, uh, mm -hmm. Because it happens as part of the same reorg process. What what happens when a post postal department becomes a post office <laughs> or a postal service? I well, guess I I blame Arthur D. Little for some of that, but not all of it. I mean, we thought at ADL that um, if we could turn the post office away from patronage and from political. Um, concerns and operated more as a corporation, as a business, uh, with attention to the bottom line, that this could only be good, uh, that it was a solution to many of the problems the, of the way the post office ran and the way post offices were set up all over the country and the kinds of services they provided and so forth. And um, it was also uh, possible for the post office to develop some new services and products as UPS and FedEx were doing and that the post office was sort of caught flat-footed. And The only thing that the post office had going for it was that it was illegal for anybody else to set up a mail system. Uh, but an overnight delivery system or, you know, document uh, 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 envelopes. These were. This was a sort of a new thing, and the post office didn't uh, have anything comparable. And we said, well, you know, if it if it uh, could develop uh, competing products or even better products, that would even you know add to the bottom line. The post office has always been subsidized. It subsidizes rural delivery, book delivery, all sorts of things which were good for the country and helped solidify this country, a huge country, so that you know, somebody in a rural area in Iowa could get a book from a New York publisher. Um, and you can even do that much easier and better today. But uh, it, was, uh, it was always fraught with uh, the, uh, the patronage aspect. That was, the post office was one of those early institutions that got caught up in patronage going back to the early 19th century and posting post office appointments were you know highly contentious you know if you were a whig or a federalist and i was a democrat you know we would have to decide when you got elected who's which of my guys were going to lose their jobs and vice versa so 
we thought that it could uh, could be helpful if the post office were run along business lines. And of course now we have post postage rates that are more competitive, but they're they're still uh, you know, not uh, not enough to keep the place uh, uh, in business. On the highest levels, you asked these questions of yourself in 1976, and I'm interested in what you think of now. The domestic council still exists in a slightly modified form. Uh, the domestic policy council exists. Mm -hmm. Did it work? Did the idea of having a central coordinating body work? Oh, yeah. It definitely worked. Um, it had the president's support. It had uh, the right guy leading it in Ehrlichman. Uh, he could speak with and for the president. Um, and if he um, had any question about whether something should be done or not, um, he, you know, it was very easy for him to walk into the president's office and say, I've got this problem, what, what do we do? Uh, Ehrlichman had the, a lot of good people on his staff to handle all sorts of parts of the government so that he didn't have to be knowledgeable in detail about everything. He had 30 people to help him, which is you know, the way the National Security Council works, OMB works. Um, it, uh, the fact that it's you know, survived all these years, but with different titles and different organizations, I think that's a testament to the fact that it was the right idea at the right time. Since he's no longer here, um, tell us a little bit about John Ehrlichman. Well, um, he was a uh, he had he had uh, a um, very uh, comfortable way of dealing with uh, the staff and with the issues. Um, he didn't. Um, he, he didn't um, suffer fools gladly, so that was good. It kept meetings short. Uh, he let you know when he liked what you were doing, and he also let you know when he didn't. Uh, he had a, he had easy access to the president, so it was never an issue about whether the domestic council was out of the loop. You know, you knew that you were in the loop. No problem. No question. Um, he and Ken Cole uh, ran a, I, I think, a tight ship. Um, there were no, there were no uh, uh, loose cannon. There were no issues left unresolved. Um, if you sent in a decision memorandum, you'd get it back in a day or two with, uh, you know, whatever decision the president had made. Um, uh, things didn't uh, linger or fester, um, you know, if the decision was made like the revenue sharing proposals, you know, it moved through the process. It could, it, it could get done. Uh, it didn't just sort of say, well, this is a great idea and then sort of, uh, wither and die after a month or two. You know, if it was a good idea, it, it moved. Now, of course, that's the, uh, that's the, uh, the it's also the negative side of, uh, of a, you know, tight, tightly organized White House structure. Uh, it's not sloppy, it's not, uh, you know, there weren't opportunities for things to come in, um, you know, outside of the process, uh, outside of the structure. Um, it's not like the West Wing on TV. Um, this, you know, this was this was a much better organized organization or structure. I want to. I said there were only two, but I actually took your time. keep going. <laughs> um, I want to get to the rest of your career, but. You mentioned the difficulties for folks from the outside, folks who are not mm -hmm. Washington bred, shall we say. Yeah. 
of encountering, and if you've ever spent any time in a bureaucracy, you know them, you know, the myriad people who actually know how to delay or stymie action. You bring up J. Edgar Hoover in the article, yep. but of course, every bureau must have at least one or two stashed away. Absolutely. How did that work on a day-to-day -day basis? How did that affect what you were doing? Well, as long as, as we had, you know, we, we commanded the high ground, so to speak, uh, with the presidency, with the office of the president, with OMB, with the domestic council, with the political appointees at the upper levels. I mean, we did the best we could with that kind of, of uh, control. But by, by, by no means was this watertight. I mean, all I can say is that the major initiatives, the major ideas, definitely were written uh, uh, closely and uh, on a daily basis by the domestic council staff. That was part of our job, was to see that these things were, in fact, moving along. We didn't just sort of throw them over the fence and say, you know, tell us how it comes out. Uh, you know, we, we checked their progress. Now, again, it, that was not my job so much as it was the other parts of the domestic council. But they were much more into implementation than I was. So they did that you know, much more uh, completely than I did. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean, it's clear that a, you know, a bureau chief or a, <clears throat> or a Senate staffer or somebody in the process, a, a lower level OMB, can always find a reason for delay or change or obstruction or changing the policy or reinterpreting it in a more favorable light. After all, that's what all those K Street lawyers get paid to, you know, to do, is to take policy decisions and to mold them in the direction that their clients uh, would like, their, their, ben their clients would benefit from. So yeah, it's, it's certainly possible. But the major initiatives, the major presidential initiatives, <clears throat> Those are things that uh, I think, you know, by and large, we, we, we achieved. We were able to get things done. Let's pause here for just a second. at the State Department, you're working on telecommunications and transportation. Right. And this is one of two times in the sub-cabinet that you get to see international trade from, from Washington. Right. What are the issues that arise when you're trying to mediate between domestic forces, mm -hmm. bureaucratic players, and then the international economy? Well, in the departments, both the state and commerce, where I worked, um, the interest groups on the outside were very well organized. In the case of the uh, State Department, I was dealing with the airline industry and with the telecommunications industry and with the shipping industry. And all three of those industries have their trade associations, their conference blocks, um, uh, groups of unions, all kinds of I mean, pilots, unions, everything. So. You, you really know who to deal with, who to talk to. It's not, there are no, no surprises, no, uh, no searching around for who's the right person to talk to. Um, the congressional staffs uh, get involved, particularly in trade, but also to some degree in, in the other issues, transportation, telecommunication. Uh, they are very constituent oriented and if they happen to be representing a, comp uh, a district or a state that has a major player in the industry, you hear from them or they want to be a part of the, uh, of the negotiations or whatever. Um, you have well-defined lines of communication within the government. When I was at the State Department, the CAB was still alive and well and that was the major 
provider of internal analysis and policy for the airline industry, the Civil Air, um, Aeronautics Board. And so they were the ones you dealt with. Uh, and every time I led a negotiation with a foreign country on the bilateral tra um, airline traffic between our two countries, I always had a member of the CAB as part of the delegation. And that member would also have maybe one or two of his staff. The Department of Transportation was the other major player. And when the CAB uh, was uh, dissolved, all of the, that analysis moved to the Department of Transportation. So then you always had somebody from the DOT on your delegation to, to help out. Um, and you always had within the State Department uh, good lines of communication with the regional bureaus. The regional bureaus or the country desks for the country or region that you were dealing with uh, were always involved in, in uh, deciding what to do and how far to go and you know, what to give and so forth. Uh, so it was a fascinating method of uh, dealing with specific issues. Now, did Kissinger get involved in any of these discussions while he was secretary? Not, a, not one. Did the deputy secretary or the undersecretary? No. My boss was the assistant secretary for economic affairs, Tom Enders, and later um, um, uh, yeah. Tom was there most of the time that I was there. Um, he, would, uh, he would be aware of what I was doing, but by and large, he would not have any uh, direct involvement. Uh, we did have some ceremonial signings, uh, particularly with the Russians. We had a Soviet agreement. Uh, we uh, got a flight for Pan Am into Leningrad, and they got a flight into uh, New York for uh, Aeroflot. And so that was a, a, you know, sort of a, a, a major considered major breakthrough in U.S.-Soviet relations, that we were actually increasing the number of flights rather than decreasing. So that one got some attention. But, the, but by and large, it was only the industry that paid attention to these negotiations. I don't even think the traveling public was very much aware of it. Now, a city like Seattle or any city wanted to expand its international presence, and they were always promoting the idea of having more foreign airlines or having U.S. airlines fly from their city to foreign destinations. So we always had cities as part of this process, too. It made it very interesting because you had a lot of different interests uh, competing. You wanted to protect the interests of the U.S. airlines, but you also wanted to increase traffic between various points. Uh, and you wanted to do it. In those days, it was on, always on a strictly bilateral basis. Uh, today, it's a little bit more open. Uh, with open skies uh, came in or, uh, in the early 80s. And um, at that point, it was possible then to think about having countries open up their whole domestic uh, uh, system to foreign penetration. Uh, and that's what we have in the United States today. The countries basically decide, the foreign airlines decide which points they want to serve in the United States. It's no longer a point-by-point -point, uh, negotiation. Although we'll probably never have Lufthansa opening Chicago to Dallas. For no, that's, that's the next stage, and that's domestic cabotage. And that basically will always probably be controlled by domestic airlines. Although you do have flights today which will uh, connect uh, through New York or Chicago or something to another city, but you can't actually pick up traffic in that U.S. city and carry it to another U.S. city. Same thing with shipping. I mean, the, the Jones Act prevents you from uh, allowing foreign ships to carry traffic between one U.S city and another. I want to ask you one quick question about shipping rates, since we bring that up. Um, the 70s are a time of real upheaval mm -hmm. in commercial shipping. Containerization starts yep. to hit. Mm -hmm. 
quite large. Yeah. There's a Wall Street Journal article which takes your side and the side of the Soviet Union um, <laughs> against uh, uh, shipping unions, mercantile unions, right. over shipping rates. There was a there was a, a major initiative by the uh, United Nations uh, to develop uh, um, international uh, shipping uh, rate conferences. Uh, conferences that always always existed in non-U.S. trade. Um, that is just like uh, in the aircraft or aviation business, uh, the trade between, let's say, Britain and India was always controlled by either British or Indian uh, shipping companies acting through their governments, uh, and nobody else could be involved. If you weren't a member of the conference, you could not participate in that trade. Now, this was contrary to U.S. policy or U.S. views, which basically said anybody ought to be able to go anywhere as long as they have some kind of, of uh, diplomatic relations or uh, uh, treaty of friendship, commerce, and navigation between one country and another. But uh, the Brits and others, uh, major shipping countries, uh, com yes, countries, including the Norwegians and the, some of the other traditional countries, Germany, France, Italy, all felt that the conference idea was a good thing, and the U.S. was a uncomfortable with that. So I ended up, <clears throat> after my experience at the, uh, the uh, State Department, writing a book for uh, the uh, American Enterprise Institute uh, talking about um, the idea of codes of conduct as a way to uh, uh, provide rules for international trade. Uh, and it was, it was just starting, and the whole idea of the United Nations at that point was we'll take uh, these shipping conferences and we'll subject them to international rules that are in this code of conduct. And sort of it's, it's like writing international legislation for a particular sector of uh, international trade or international economy. And this is a process entirely separate from GATT. Yes, yes. GATT was uh, only for trade, uh, only for trade in goods, later for services. And um, you know it morphed into the World Trade Organization. Um, the whole idea of GATT was to establish rules so that countries knew how their products would be treated in a foreign country. You spent about two years over in the State Department. And then you come back to the White House, but it's a different administration. Now it's a Ford administration, correct? What brings you back? Well, um, it was partly the fact that it's now the post-Watergate environment. Um, I felt that uh, my first experience in the Nixon White House had been um, somewhat tarnished by Watergate and what people would ask me you know, were you part of Watergate, or what did you know about it, or what did you do? Um, and if I tried to explain to them that I was part of the Domestic Council, their eyes began to glaze over, and they said, well, you know, if you don't have any juicy Watergate stories, you know, I'm not interested. So it was partly that. It was also partly that I had, um, uh, I still had friends on the staff who are now working for uh, Ford, specifically Ken Cole, who had taken over Ford's um, domestic council, and they were doing a broad policy review under Rockefeller, um, and that was what brought me back to the White House. They basically said, we need some people here who have had experience with a large number of diverse issues, and in that case, uh, at least Ken Cole knew who I was. and. 
I don't think the vice president did. I don't think uh, Rockefeller did. But but uh, it was you know it was a congenial way to move back into the White House. Your portfolio includes some hot topics at that point. Right. Intelligence is well after the domestic policy analysis that I helped with uh, Rockefeller and um, Cole, um, there was another little issue brewing on the side dealing with the intelligence community. And the, um, the church committee on the Hill and the, uh, the Rockefeller Commission, even before he became vice president, had sort of looked into the operations of the CIA and they didn't like what they saw. And a lot of the former agents were publishing books that were not uh, vetted by the agency and uh, newspapers were full of lurid stories about things that the agency had done or had tried to do or was planning to do. And there were a lot of people leaving the agency who felt that they were no longer uh, either appreciated or that they wanted to be whistleblowers and, and say something about what they had done. So it was a very unhealthy environment for conducting intelligence operations, which are supposed to be quiet and clandestine and covert, and you know, this was none of it. Um, so. Um, President Ford um, had a small group, and I was part of that, to look at the intelligence operations and try to decide what do we do about these things? Uh, what do we do about this issue? Uh, this is before the election campaign really got underway in 1980, uh, 80, no, 76. Um, and the uh, the goal of Jack Marsh, who was President uh, Ford's uh, right-hand man for policy issues, sort of like an Ehrlichman for, for uh, Ford, um, was saying we need to do something about getting this issue under control so it's no longer an issue in the campaign. So I was uh, asked to put together a couple of analyses, which are big fat books, which I did for the president and uh, the NSC, a uh, couple of presentations, which I gave to the president and to the NSC, um, the cabinet level officers, uh, and to write with the uh, committee's help uh, an executive order to put some rules in place for what the CIA or, or the intelligence community more broadly, not just the CIA, could do. Uh, what would be considered in bounds and what was out of bounds. And also some of procedural rules, uh, how whistleblowers would be treated, uh, the role of the attorney general, uh, the role of um, uh, in a private, um, uh, an, um, intelligence review board of non-governmental, non-intelligence people, um, the roles of the um, committees on the Hill. Um, and in fact, uh, was the establishment of new committees, uh, intelligence committees that had never existed before that was part of this process, and how their briefings should be handled. And it was a fascinating process, and it was all under a very short timetable. Um, I think we, we did all of this in a couple of months, and it was the most uh, interesting and rewarding part of my government experience. Did this include the executive order on executive action? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a lot of those executive uh, um, executive order positions have been maintained in the intervening, I don't know, 40 years, 35 years. But with tweaking, I mean, obviously, Democrats come in and they do some tweaking in one direction, and then Republicans come in and they tweak in the other direction. 
but the same you know the same structure is basically there. George Bush is director of the CIA at this point. Yes. Do you meet with him? Yes. Yeah, he had just come in. Uh, Colby had been the director. He left, um, and Bush was coming in. He'd been, uh, I think, most recently in China as ambassador, or maybe at the UN, but one or the other. So he was not a stranger to international affairs by any means. But I think coming into this issue, uh, he was not really um, uh, aware of all of the issues. But he very quickly became aware, and we had a couple of meetings, and then he was part of all of the cabinet meetings with uh, the president and uh, NSC. The NSC is the you know Secretary of State, Treasury, uh, the Attorney General, um, President, Vice President, Secretary of Defense. So when you say you were giving briefings to the NSC, it wasn't just Scowcroft and Oh no, this was because in the cabinet the room, room with the president and the vice president and all of the cabinet secretaries, and I've got some very nice pictures showing me, you know, standing up there with the PowerPoint presentation, uh, you know, going, taking them through the issues and what we were proposing. Were there any fears? I know it's become quite famous recently, of course, that Vice President Cheney and Secretary Rumsfeld were upset over what they saw as the weakening of the CIA's ties to the executive branch. Were these the sorts of considerations that were brought up at that point? Um, the main concern was to maintain the, uh, the idea that the president per se, the president himself, could retain some degree of plausible deniability, which sounds like an unusual, I mean, these people work for the president, but that the specific actions that the CIA was undertaking did not necessarily have his approval. In other words, he was not the one, or the vice president was not the one, who would be authorizing a particular break-in or activity or intelligence gathering maneuver. Um, so that was, that was kind of in the back of everybody's mind. But you still had to have a way for um, people who were in the intelligence agencies or in the government generally to raise an issue if they thought something was uh, not, not appropriate. And that's why we had appeals through uh, the Attorney General uh, and uh, his, his staff. Uh, we wanted to keep them out of the press. We wanted to keep them off the front pages. We didn't want them to become political issues about you know, the Democrats did this, Republicans did that. These are supposed to be national concerns, national issues, and beyond domestic politics. Well, it strikes me that this is a different impetus than that behind the domestic council. Instead of bending agencies to the president's political will, yeah. it's insulating the agencies from those sorts of considerations. Well, that's a nice way to put it, yeah. And also to make sure that the president's involvement in these activities is quite different from domestic policy or, or other national security policies, diplomatic policies, that you know, his, his involvement is not as direct as, uh, as it would be in the other issues. It's a very different mindset from the Houston plan. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's interesting too that you know many of the same players, as you mentioned, Scowcroft, uh, Cheney, others, um, you know that certainly they've been, you know, involved in these issues for 20, 30 years. been in the agencies, mm -hmm. um, and you've been in kind of the wider world of international politics. A company like Boeing cannot mm -hmm. stay out of international politics. True. How have things changed between when you got to Washington and, and when you've come to Washington State? Well, one of the reasons I left Washington, the other Washington for Seattle, was um, I did not... Uh, 
uh, like the uh, the atmosphere in Washington D.C. It was becoming too contentious, too uh, uh, personally vindictive um, for a person who was used to, as a student, the idea that a problem or a, an equation had one solution, not three or four, or that a legal decision uh, is binding and therefore people ought to pay attention to it. Uh, the political world is so much more fluid, ambiguous, uh, and personal uh, that it was unsatisfying. I mean, I felt personally uh, uh, distant. And it was fine while I was, you know, in important jobs and on the inside, if you will, uh, playing the game. But once I got outside, then I started looking at this from a different perspective, and I didn't really want to be a part of that as directly as I was. Plus, I had remarried and had a new family, uh, you know, so it was a question of where are we going to raise these kids. And, and fortunately, I had uh, met some people from Boeing, including the chairman, and it was a fairly easy, uh, not easy, but I mean, at least I had a contact with the company, and I, I like this style, I like what they did. As I said, uh, it was nice to be able to walk out the back door of the office and actually see a factory that was producing something instead of just shuffling paper. And, you know, there was a, it, was a, it was a different uh, environment, much more satisfying. Why do you go back to Washington at 81? Why didn't I? Why did you? In co as commerce, the assistance oh, of commerce. Oh, well, I I never left Washington. I was there all during the the uh, Carter years. I worked on the administration's uh, transition out during the transition from Ford to, to Carter, and then I worked worked on the Reagan transition in again with Ed Harper and some of the old gang from the Nixon White House. And I came away with the impression that in 1981, I needed to get one more uh, dose of government experience. And it, I needed to move up the steps. So I was going to be a, an assistant secretary, presidential appointment, Senate uh, approval. Had to be in the international arena, because that's what I had come to like best. Um, and the uh, Commerce Department was looking for people to uh, support Mac Baldridge, who was the incoming Secretary of Commerce. And um, so that was the job. And I, I, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be long. I, I'd be there for another couple of years and just do that job. Um, traveled an awful lot during that time and uh, got my fill of uh, that and left the government in 82, I guess, or 83, and then uh, moved out here in 85. When you come out here, you become involved in quite a few groups. One of them uh, is the committee that is bringing the, <laughs> the 99 uh, WTO yeah. summit to Seattle. What was that like? How did you get involved? Well, I would say that meeting was close to a disaster as you could get, um, but, if you look back a few years before that, we had a very successful meeting during the Clinton years of the APEC leaders, the Asia Pacific Economic uh, Council Corporation. And there was a new idea that Clinton had that we, we should get the leaders of the APEC countries to come someplace. And we bid for that in Seattle, and sure enough, they picked us. So we did a very good job on that one, and I chaired that committee. And so when the WTO came around, uh, it was about uh, five years later, uh, I said, well, we, you know, we could 
post the WTO, we did APEC, you know, what's the difference? Well, it turned out there's a big difference. Uh, by that time, um, international trade had become a political issue, uh, a street issue, um, a lot of um, antagonism in interest groups, unions, uh, agricultural groups, uh, all kinds of folks uh, to international trade generally and to the WTO specifically because of some of its policies and decisions. And so we had basically five days of chaos and street theater and missed meetings and all kinds of uh, stuff going on here, which uh, was not pleasant for those of us who were trying to uh, hold a meeting. Our job was basically to provide the space, the parties, uh, the transportation, book the hotel rooms, make sure everybody was looked after while they were here. Um, that was the committee, the host committee's job. Uh, the city, the state, the FBI, and Secret Service were looking after uh, security and making sure that the streets were open and the demonstrators were under some control. And of course, we, you know, we failed miserably on that on that score. I'm not sure what anybody could have done differently. Well, I don't, I don't know. We, you know, we all second guessed and we said, you know, we should have had martial law. We should have had a cordoned off area. We should have uh, gotten, you know, more help on the streets early on. But then you look at all the meetings, all the international meetings that have happened since Seattle, and almost every one is either chaotic or it is held within a very tightly uh, controlled area. I mean, in some places, they just cordon off a part of the city, and protesters, demonstrators can't even get close to the buildings, much less uh, interfere with the meetings. So I think a lot of people have learned from our experience here I think in Seattle they had to hold it on, a, and in Savannah they held it on an island. Yeah, that, well, that's the, the same thing in, well, Abu Dhabi and all kinds of places. Yeah. As you look back, is there anything that we haven't covered? Any anecdote that you'd like to preserve <laughs> for the record? No, I think you've covered an awful lot of my background. In fact, I was telling my wife on the way to, over here. Uh, I don't know what I'm going to be able to talk about for 15 minutes. He said, don't worry about it. It's up to him to ask you questions. Well, you've done that. You've done an excellent job. You obviously have compiled a lot of um, background about what I was involved in, more so than I, uh, I, I uh, recalled. Uh, two quick anecdotes just for the, one, just to show you my naivete. When I first got to the White House, um, and this must have been, you know, uh, probably in January of uh, 71, um, there was a motorcade, a presidential motorcade going up to the hill, and I was invited to go along. So I walked out the old executive office building, and there lined up are all of the cars in the motorcade going, you know, to the hill. And so I'm looking around, and I just jump in the first car that I see, which is the one right in front of me. And I'm sitting in the back of the car and waiting. The next thing I know, uh, Haldeman comes in, and he opens the door from the other side because he's on the White House side. And he looks at me, and he says, uh, you know, who are you? And I say, well, I'm Ray Waldman. I just... Uh, Join the staff. And he said, um, do you know where you're supposed to be? And I said, well, I'm th part of this motorcade. He said, well, not in this car, so get out. <laughs> so that was my, my introduction to the world of uh, structured motorcades, among other structured things, you know, that you just don't sort of drop into um, Haldeman's or Ehrlichman's or Kissinger's car or you know, sit down at their table at lunch. I mean, you know, there are, there are things you don't do. Um, the, uh, the only other thing of that nature, well, there were two other things. One is uh, I was invited to the presidential uh, prayer breakfast. And uh, 
I said, what time does that start? And they said, oh, it's 7 o'clock or something. I said, well, I don't like to get up that early. I'm, I'll, I'll come a little later. I'll, I'll see you guys at the office. And of course, I didn't realize what a big deal this was. Um, we're in uh, New Orleans for a uh, uh, vice presidential speech. And this is again when we're selling the idea to the National County Executives Organization of revenue sharing for uh, local government affairs. And the vice president is there uh, to uh, give a speech. And afterwards, and I was invited to go along because I had helped to write the message and the speech and the legislation. And they thought maybe some question would arise and it might be nice if somebody would. But I think it was basically just to give me a little um, you know, trip. I didn't come down in his airplane, but I came down separately. And so he invites uh, the six or eight of us out to lunch to a restaurant in, in uh, French Quarter. And we're all sitting at the table, and the vice president's there, and I'm, I'm the junior guy, so I'm over here. We all have a very nice lunch, and then the waiter comes around with the uh, dessert menus, and everybody gets a dessert menu. And so then he starts to take the orders, and the vice president says, no, I don't think I'll have any dessert. So the next guy says, no, I don't think I'll have any dessert. No, not nothing. All the way around the table until they get to me, and I said, well, this, uh, this thing looks good. Well, I'll, I'll have one of those. And everybody's looking at me. You know, don't you realize that you're not supposed to, you know, he's set the tone. We're, we're about to get up and go. So they're all fuming for the next five minutes while my dessert comes in. And I'm eating as fast as I can because by now I get the idea that this was a major faux pas. But I said, well, if they asked me if I want dessert. And, you know, I said yes. So after those experiences, I, I started to learn a little bit more about how to behave in these uh, situations. But that just goes to show you how, how naive I was. <laughs> Mr. Walden, thank you very much.